Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Backyard Professor Live show on a Sunday evening. Uh, tonight, I want to do something that's really kind of fun for me, kind of interesting. Uh, let me know how the sound is. Is the sound okay? I'm trying to use my quality mic. Uh, I, I hope I enabled it in the settings. I'm sure I did. It said Yeti instead of the inbuilt microphone. So anyway, uh, this subject is always intriguing. The very fact that Joseph Smith had, okay, thank you, Mo, see ya. Thank you. Thank you, Newton Lemos. Welcome, by the way. Hey, Doug Vincent, good man, good man. Corey Hoare, 3050. Tim Rathbone, looks like you're here. Peter Higgs, welcome, everybody. Good to see y'all. Mark Crispin, yeah, baby. Come on, I got to do that. Everybody expects it. So, and Alan Zabriskie, welcome, everybody. Paul Osborne and Dan Vogel, yeah, the two I'm going to be uh, talking about tonight and utilizing their research and work. The fact that Joseph Smith had magic parchments is really incredible when you really ponder that. And when, when we say magic parchments, man, we're not kidding. We mean magic parchments, and I didn't get this cropped. I apologize. Kind of, kind of far away. I didn't mean to make it that far away. That doesn't help. It does. It gets rid of my ugly mug. But this magic parchment right here, that figure in the bottom right-hand corner, is what I'm going to be talking about quite a bit tonight. But the very fact that Joseph Smith had uh, magic parchments. And kept them, and there's a whole slew of them that Dan Vogel has done a spectacular uh, video on, and I know Mormonism Live has talked about it with him. And so magic, now when we say magic with these magic parchments, we mean genuine magic. D. Michael Quinn broke, broke out and explored this extensively in his early Mormonism and the Magic Worldview. Dan Vogel has discussed it quite a bit. Several people, uh, Homer Durham, I believe, was talking about it. He got in trouble with it. He was connecting it to Freemasonry there for a while. So when we say magic, we mean the Renaissance magic of John Gee. D. John Gee. Yeah. <laughs> He's older than you think, right? <laughs> yeah, baby. Go, John. Now, John D., the uh, Elizabethan mage, uh, I mean, we're talking magic. Uh, yeah, there's black magic, white magic, yellow magic, green magic. Who cares what color it is? But we're talking magic. We're talking communication as Barrett in his book, The Magus, talks about. Oh, speaking of which. Hang on, I gotta go grab Barrett real quick. Sorry, I've got to do my backyard professor thing. Gotta go grab the book. I was supposed to grab this beforehand. The Magus, the complete cult philosophy, occult philosophy. Uh, we're talking the communication with intelligences and spirits and uh angels, lots of different angels. There are seven different angels on the magical papyri or the, the magical parchments of Joseph Smith. We're talking demons. We're talking devils. Genuine magic. These parchments, his magic dagger, he was involved in magic practices from a very early age on, without question. And so, of course, the church did not like that. Smith, apparently, as time went on, you know, he got in the 1826 kerfluffle with the law. They found him guilty. Uh, they confessed to treasure digging and promised they wouldn't do it again. Um, and then he kept the parchments anyway. 
used a seer stone, which was used for treasure digging. All of this was denied by the church for years. In my youth, in my ironic priesthood youth, from the time I was baptized, from being a deacon to the teacher to the priest to going on my mission, this was anti-Mormon argument. Fundamentally so. There is no, I mean, the critics are so desperate, so bereft of the Holy Spirit's guidance that they invent and make up all this magic involvement. Hugh Nibley said if there was ever a court record that showed Joseph was found guilty of treasure digging, it would completely destroy Joseph Smith, and then that record was found. And of course, it didn't destroy Joseph Smith. So I suppose you could say, thank goodness, Hugh Nibley wasn't a very valid prophet, right? His scholarship is also now seriously questioned, however. So, you know, there is that. <laughs> so this theme, this magical theme, these magic parchments, what do they have to do with Joseph Smith and early Mormonism? When you really take a step back, take a deep breath, and do your homework. Mormonism is not based upon revelation as a pure influx of the Holy Ghost from God in righteousness. It is based on magical intelligences, scrying, seer stones, treasure digging, and communication with spirits who helped you find the treasure. And this is the theme of the angel Moroni, who tutored Joseph Smith for four years about the gold plates. We all know the story. He kept going back at the, uh, at the proper astrological time in September 21st, the uh, equinox, to be instructed by the angel Moroni once a year for four straight years before he could get the gold plates out of the box, the stone box, etc. We're all familiar with that story now. Uh, and then, of course, you have the famous Mark Hoffman salamander forgeries, etc. We don't have to worry about going into that. This parchment is a very interesting piece of evidence that I want to talk about just a little bit, especially with this name. This is a very interesting name, Juban Lades. Now, I've, I've heard it pronounced Juban Lades. Vogel has said perhaps Juban Ladachi. It, it doesn't matter. That figure is out of Scott, and the one under it is out of Sibley quite a bit later. But it is pretty much, for the most part, the same figure. It is that figure. It is that name that is in the bottom right-hand corner of this parchment, which Joseph Smith did own. So it's a very interesting situation that we have with this, and I, I think I can find this page. This is a, I asked Dan earlier today. I called him on the phone and asked if I could use some of his uh, slides, and he graciously agreed. Thank you very much, Dan Vogel. You are a true scholar and a gentleman, but it's so small I can't read it. Hold on. I may have to pull the computer all the way up to my face here so I can read this for you. I don't have a big screen. Juban Ladas, distinguished in the dominion of thrones as is appointed guardian of all public national enterprises where the good of for the good of society and the honor of God are unitedly concerned. He is dedicated in all the I can't read it. Celest he is the celestial messenger bearing a flaming sword girded about the loins with an helmet on his head, 
and thus is the magical character by which he is distinguished and which is worn by many as a layman around the neck for a protective, I think, Anyway, I apologize. I was I, I think I've got this in a bigger slide. That's who who this character is. It is a celestial angel with a flaming sword. Now, where have we heard that expression before? Yeah, Joseph Smith during polygamy. He was given months and years of time to decide whether he was going to live polygamy after the revelation came. And when it came time for the young girl that he was hesitating with, the angel showed up with the flaming sword. Some say it's the, not a flaming sword, it's just a sword. Irrelevant, really. The story of a flaming sword is in the history. Threatened Joseph Smith with his life and said, practice polygamy or you die. Now, so much for you know, free agency. Mormons love to make a big deal about that free agency thing. And, uh, you know, obviously the angel didn't give a rat's ass about Joseph Smith's free agency. You will do this or die. That's not being given a choice, much of a choice. So Joseph, who had spent many, many months, if not years, hesitating, not doing it, goes to the young girl and gives her till the next day, introduces the idea of polygamy and says, you're going to be my wife young teenage girl, and you have exactly one day, otherwise you're going to be damned forever. Now, what a convenience, right? Horrible story in church history. Of course, none of us, <laughs> there again, none of us heard this story in cemetery, let alone Sunday school or any other church meeting. No, of course not, uh, because it's one of the most heinous, damning stories against Joseph Smith in this supposed revealed doctrine that he's ever concocted. And uh, yeah, you know, let's leave that one out of the history books, boys, along with all of the treasure digging. See, that is what made Gerald and Sandra Tanner so feared and so hated and reviled and villainous because they simply uncovered the Oxford history that had been hidden and came out with it. And, uh, I remember I had a couple of friends in high school who really did attempt to get me to read the actual history that the church was suppressing. And that was a huge word in my youth. You know, they are suppressing from the Anna Mormons, of course. And, and we, of course, said that's just a bunch of poppycock and lies. We've got the official history of the church, you know. Hold up the uh, ensign. <laughs> and uh, so this magic theme is really, really spectacularly interesting for an interesting reason that Paul Osborne, who is in the audience tonight, uh, we are going to do some speculation. I think it's fun to do this. I think it's very energizing because it broadens and opens us up to uh, more possibilities, but not only are we going to do some speculation, we are going to do some actual reading and studying of the reasoning behind this. And I want to get to this. Um, I was supposed to get to this earlier. Here it is. I'm going to bring this up so that I can read this. To you, there is a, uh, a particular thread on the Shades Message Discuss Mormonism message board, Vogel's video on magic parchment and the Jupiter talisman. See, that's the other thing. Joseph Smith had that safety magic talisman that helped thwart his enemies until, of course, they killed him. Um, well, this thread has 192,000 views. I mean, man, this is the most popular thread in decades. So the information here is quite exquisite and interesting. We were all very excited when uh, Vogel told us what he was doing. And so the thing about the three stars... Let me get back to this. The thing about the three stars 
in the document, right there. Hopefully you can see my, that upper picture. See that long cross pointing off toward the right. It looks like there's a bow. It almost looks like a cross being shot by a bow. And then there's three circles, three dots, three stars, potential ideas. Now, this sigil that is worn on a layman that is a piece of parchment that is on worn by the practitioner of the magic, this sigil is in the parchment, in the bag. This is the starry messenger from the air protecting, uh, helping, thwarting the enemies, etc. Juban Ladash. This has been speculated by Paul Osborne to be none other than the interesting constellation of Orion. And this is quite interesting to me. So let's take a look at some of this information. Joban Ladach, the definition by the Renaissance magases is to carry the triumph and ensign of victories. Of course, he's facing off the bull. And in the Greek myths, um, Perseus, Orion, they were all kind of stuck together in the mythological hero materials. And... Uh, but this is, this is what Orion was doing. The mythology of Orion is quite interesting, how he became a constellation. He was one of the early giants. He was so big that uh, he could swim in the sea, and he was still halfway above the water. He splits the equator. He, uh, his, the, his upper body is in the north part of the equator, and his lower body is in the south part. I mean, it's a gigantic constellation. You can't see it in this picture, but he's standing on the hair, and you can see the bull there where he's fighting the bull with the club and with the sword. Well, it's most interesting that this sign of Juban Ladash could be associated with Orion's belt, the three stars in a row, because he is known by various characters and symbols as the celestial messenger, as was Moroni, right? So is Moroni just Joseph Smith's use of Juban Ladash? We do know based on the information on the parchments, Joseph Jupiter's talisman, of course, the Magus's uh, the Magus, Barrett's the Magus, has the various talismans and the Jupiter talisman and how to make it. We know Joseph Smith had access to a huge magical library, far more than we had anticipated when I was a teenager. So very interesting that, well, here's a true relation of Dr. D., Actions and spirits. This was back in the Renaissance. Remember, he always bears a flaming sword, is girded about having a helmet upon his head, and appearing still before the party in the air, just like Moroni, or else that other angel who had a flaming sword, to Joseph Smith later on in his life, right? D says, I pray you to declare unto us your name. Juban Ladache says, My name is Juban Ladache. D says, well, if I should not offend you, I would gladly know of what order you are or how your state is in respect of Michael and Gabriel, Raphael and Uriel. See, these are the main angels of magic. And of course, we know uh, we've heard a little bit about Michael and Gabriel, not so much Raphael, but Uriel 
in the Bible and the apocryphal writings of Christianity. The figure says to John D., unto men according unto their deserts and the first excellency of their soul, God hath appointed a good governor or angel from amongst the orders of those that are blessed. For every soul that is good is not of one and the self-same dignification. Notice how this angel being figure is talking in John D.'s language, right? Therefore, according to his excellency, we are appointed as ministers from that order, whereunto his excellency accordeth, to the intent that he may be brought at last to supply those places which were glorified by a former, and also to the intent that the prince of darkness might be counterpoised in God's justice. In other words, these are the guardian angels, and he is one of them. This is the rank of angels that Juban Ladache comes from. Amongst the which I am one, which am the keeper and defender of this man present, which carry the triumphant ensign of victories continually before him, as a reproach to my adversary and his, and to confirm the dignity whereunto he is called by the presence of this character. You see, they were wearing these sigils on layman's on their body, like Joseph Smith was wearing the Jupiter talisman for protection. They, too, were doing the same thing. And Joseph, somewhere along the line now, someone made these manuscripts, and somewhere, somehow, Joseph Smith's family got a hold of these manuscripts, and they kept them. We do know this is not from the biblical influence stream, because we have been able to trace, we, I say we, John, uh, or I mean, uh, Dan Vogel has, and D. Michael Quinn, and Homer Durham, and all those guys have traced the, the beginning, the origins, where all of the various figures from the magic parchments came from, the Jupiter talisman, the symbolisms, their meaning, etc. All of this came from magical themes, times, places, and peoples, right? The angel Moroni did not give Joseph Smith these magical parchments. We do know that, right? So, Let's move on here. I'll put my cute little mug down here. Oh, maybe I won't. I won't be able to read it. So in Reginald Scott, in his articulation of Juban Ladache, the characters that form the sign for Juban Ladache are at the top of page 498 in the link provided above. Interestingly enough, no, this is Shulam talking about it. He's saying, interestingly enough, we can learn more about the nature of the angel Juban Ladache and treasure seeking. This is one of the themes that this angel was involved with, beginning on the previous page, concerning the distinct order of starry spirits. And this is so important. Reginald Scott wrote, these astral spirits are variously to be considered. Some are beings, separate and absolute, that are not constitute to any work or service. Others are subservient to the angels that have dominion over the influences of the stars. When treasure hath been hid, or any secret thing hath been committed by the party, there is a magical cause of something attracting the starry spirit back again to the manifestation of that thing, upon all which the following chapters do insist more largely and particularly. Don't you love how they used to talk? Wow. They don't say, yo, hey, dude. <laughs> uh, so Paul Osborne asks a very important question here. So what is this starry spirit? And from whence doeth it come? Good question. 
Reginald Scott again, page 501, said, Nor can it easily be denied that to every man and woman, while they live the natural life, there belongs, while they live the natural life, there belongs a sidereal or starry spirit. And the question Shulam was wanting to find out is, so what star or stars within the starry sky does this refer to? Reference to the side reel is directly associated to the constellations of fixed stars, and this cannot refer to the planets. So it certainly can be argued that the Orion constellation is the most well-known of all the constellations, and, and that is strictly true. Fundamentally so, yes, indeed. And there it is. Now, here's the sigil. This is in Reginald Scott, 1886, The Discovery of Witchcraft. And notice the title. We're talking about magic and witchcraft here, where the influences put into those parchments, which were owned and used by Joseph Smith during his treasure digging, presumably, um, are to be had. This is not Melchizedek priesthood, Holy Ghost stuff. This is pure magic. This is sigils and magic angel names, etc. And the, the three belts, the three stars in Orion's belt and the stars by his shield, that's, that's pretty decent representation from a magic point of view. That's what Shulam, Paul Osborne, is trying to say. I think it's quite fascinating. This too, Reginald Scott wrote this. Juban Ladache is a mighty prince in the dominion of thrones. Now, isn't that what Moroni was as a warrior in the end times of the Nephites in the Book of Mormon? He cometh unto such as follow natural affairs and are carried forth unto war and conquest. There's Moroni, right? He beareth always a flaming sword. Well, okay. Moroni probably didn't carry a flaming sword, but he was definitely fighting by the sword. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of his people fell by those swords. And is girded about having a helmet upon his head and appearing still before the party in the air. He must be solicited and invocated with chastity, vows, fumes, and prayers. And this is his character to be worn as a laman, and then you see the character. There it is. So the last characters, other than the cross, for John D's Juban Dalache are elements that involve astronomical signs pertaining to the heavens. Very interesting. Now here is a group of Angel names that are associated with various sigils and symbols in relationship to the angels and the planets. There, each one of them has a planetary orb associated with them. So we're talking astronomical, magic, etc. It all ties in the earthly and the heavenly. This is by no means unknown to Joseph Smith in his day, nor to people who hang around him throughout his life. Once again, this sigil with a, yet another picture of Orion that Shulam shows us. Here is the very famous Three belts of Orion and how they line up perfectly with the three dots, the shield. That signal seems to be associated with Orion, very interestingly. Here it is in the lower right-hand corner. And, and whoever drew this, um, it is a little bit looser. It's a little bit somewhat different and hazy. Dan Vogel did a good job showing the differences, the similarities, et cetera, of this signal. So, again, on the message board, uh, Paul Osborne is saying, as mentioned earlier, the 
connection between treasure seeking and a starry spirit is introduced in the Renaissance magic books in the section leading up to the disclosure of the name and the lawman of the first of seven good angels, Juban Ladache. And that number seven is very famous. I mean, you have seven good angels, you've got seven planets, you've got seven days of the week, etc., etc., etc. The number seven has always been huge in both mythology, history, religion, magic. The number seven is absolutely overwhelmingly abundantly demonstrated by Philo, the contemporary of Jesus, the historian, in, in his books. So Reginald Scott wrote, when treasure hath been hid or any secret thing hath been committed by the party, there is a magic cause of something attracting the starry spirit back again. Now, the angel Moroni told Joseph Smith to meet him once a year, every year on the hill before he could get those gold plates. Joseph Smith later described that series of meetings as a teaching, as a, a school, a schooling of him, etc. This is what Reginald Scott is talking about. Joseph Smith would have been obviously familiar with this kind of a magical philosophy. He just changed the names to protect the innocent, apparently. But Scott says there is a magical cause of something attracting the starry spirit back again to the manifestation of that thing, upon all which the following chapters do insist more largely and particularly. So Paul Osborne says the magical quest for treasure seeking is emphasized multiple times after disclosing the name and nature of Juban Ladache and the angels. Scott next wrote to the next belong such spirits as the protectors of hidden treasures. I mean, for all the world, you could say that's Moroni. Could you not? Seriously, that is certainly who, what his role was with the youthful Joseph Smith for years, years, who by conjuration attempted to dig for such defended treasures by magical experiments and have discovered hidden treasures. Now, wow, that's this is huge. Paul says, slippery treasures found their way into the Book of Mormon, wherein Juban Ladache was replaced by Moroni, who, like Juban Ladache was a mighty prince in the dominion of thrones. He cometh unto such as follow national affairs and are carried forth unto war and conquest, similar to Moroni in Book of Mormon times. I mean, that that's, come on, that's that's good. He further says, Joseph Smith's treasure-seeking in coordination with others, was to obtain treasures for the purpose of obtaining riches. And this is what he later called his folly, his youthful follies, right? That was the bottom line. The magical parchments were supposed to aid in that endeavor. And Vogel's podcast gives us a fascinating insight into treasure digging. Yeah, I would encourage everybody to go watch that if you haven't yet. If you have, go watch it again anyway. Yes, thank you, Tim Rathbone. The Autumnal Equinox, September 21st and 22nd. Yeah. It's safe to assume that Smith and those whom he kept intimate company with were familiar with the parchments and the purposes in which they were used. Magical parchment, parchments with curious writings, along with the assistance of magical spirits, was a means in which treasure could be found and secured. So the need for Jubilandache and other strange spirits, absolutely. I mean, all of this just meshes with what we know now, once the church got caught with its pants down and had to let out the real history. But treasure digging for Joseph Smith changed when it came to the golden place. And this is an important point here. 
Religion and spiritual awakening became the new motive rather than wealth and riches. Recall how Moroni warned Joseph that the plates were not supposed to enrich the Smith family, and through Moroni, Joseph Smith later said that Satan would try to tempt me in consequence of the indigent circumstances of my father's family to get the plates for the purpose of getting rich. So we learned in the 1832 account that Smith confesses to his greediness, saying, For now I had been tempted of the adversary, and sought the place to obtain riches, and kept not the commandment that I should have an eye single to the glory of God. So here we see, without question, that it's clear that Joseph Smith was transitioning his treasure-seeking motives from that of material wealth to spiritual wealth, and what this did is it formed his religion, which then, of course, became his sole objective. The Book of Mormon became the goal in which Joseph would transition into his new role as a prophet and prepare the world for the return of Christ in America. And, of course, part of this very fascinating role, part of this really interesting prophet role that Joseph Smith was now transitioning into involved and included building up cities, buildings, temples, houses, collectively putting the wealth together of as many people who he could convert so that they might build temples which would solidify the community through their rituals and through their communal eating and through their religious and spiritual fasts and testimony bearing, through their going on missions together, through their persecutions, through their trials, through their triumphs, this coalesced into a community that had common goals which led to being rich anyway in many respects now and see here's the issue here's the problem when we say rich today we're not talking bill gates rich but i mean you know when you look at the uh the type of dwellings that people lived in in joseph smith's day just rude wooden almost one room shacks with grass roofs, right? But I mean, even if you couldn't get that, you were in trouble because you were exposed to the elements. So hopping together, working together, helping each other build homes, hew stone out of mountains or collect stones from riverbeds, etc., to help them make solid shelters, bunch together, cooperate together in seeding the fields, harvesting the, the foods, raising the animals, etc. There is a wealth aspect of that in a community effort which is where Joseph Smith shifted, broadening, as it were, his major vision. Yeah. So this is kind of the area, this is kind of the, uh, the direction that we see Joseph Smith going. And it does make sense, of course, because we think life is rough now. Life was rough then, you know. You, we've heard about his leg operation with no anesthesia. I, I couldn't possibly fathom that. I mean, can you imagine when you needed a dentist? I mean, come on, we hate dentists today. It's a cakewalk in a paradise compared to what they had in Joseph Smith's day, right? So this is a fascinating development that we have the interesting thing is we actually do have evidence based upon suppressed history. We have artifactual evidence that ties so very well with that suppressed history. 
that there really isn't any doubt anymore that Joseph Smith was a treasure digger, that he had seer stones and used the same seer stone that he stole from Sally Chase and never gave back, but he promised he would, to hunt for treasure is the same seer stone that he translated the Book of Mormon using. Even that was suppressed the artistic design of Joseph Smith, the paintings, the drawings, and all that, for over a century have been deliberately drawn, painted incorrectly based on actual descriptions we have now, so that it came as a shock to so many, and Dan Bogle has a video on this too, on Joseph Smith's ear stones. There were some in the church when that I do believe it was, what, 20, 2016 already? 2017, when that book on Joseph Smith's ear stones from the first presidency's vault, the church, finally allowed pictures of Joseph Smith's ear stone out. It shocked a lot of Mormons. They, they still couldn't believe it. <laughs> you know, when Richard Bushman wrote his rough stone rolling book, and he included... So much more of the nuanced history I saw online where many Mormons were freaking out on social media saying that the anti-Mormons had hacked the church's official website and they had to warn the church that the anti-Mormons were putting up anti-Mormon crap when it was the church essays being published sponsored by the first presidency, man. And there were people so uninformed because of the way the leaders falsely presented the official history. They thought the church was being attacked. They said a cleansing at the church office building must occur. Anti-Mormons have been hired and there are wolves in sheep's clothing within our very midst. That's astonishing when you really stop and think about it. The same thing with all this information I'm sharing tonight. And I'm not sharing anything new. Anybody who's been paying attention on, on YouTube or with the, I mean, there have now, thanks to the, largely thanks to the efforts of the Tanners uh, and Fawn Brody and Dale Morgan and Dan Vogel and uh, D. Michael Quinn, uh, the church was virtually forced to begin to reassess, and they have tried mightily. I don't know if you recall Richard Lloyd Anderson's big article in the Ensign on the, the treasure digging and the mature Joseph Smith, where he tries to put a positive spin on this because his church had lied for decades and decades and decades about how absolutely apostate, horrible, heinous, wicked this was. A pure satanic practice. And now they're caught having to admit it. Well, okay, yeah, that's actually happened. And yet they had excommunicated people for saying that. So now the church scholars were trying to put their best foot forward and soft pedal it, but they were forced to admit it. Well, this, this comes as a shock because our Holy Ghost-born testimonies end up being seen as fart in the wind. Based on a lie, that's hard to swallow. You know what I mean? So, so this is the really difficult uh, issue that is happening when we discuss magic. And now this is a very important point brought up. I'm, I'm happy to have this so that I can share it. Dot cam and see for me. Well, it is a symbol of God's protection. Now, they're talking about this guardian angel sigil on the magic parchment that had several different crosses with it. That's what they're talking about. The cross is a symbol of God's protection. 
So Paul Osborne says, okay, the various crosses on Smith's parchments are associated with esoteric rites. Now, let me give you this context here. Esoteric rites, so that you understand the actual significance of this, think temple endowment. Okay? Now, you know how serious either you used to take that, or maybe your parents still do, your grandparents, brothers, sisters, whoever, if you don't, or if you still do and you're watching this video. When we're talking esoteric rites in the magic world view, the TBM Mormons need to say Mormon temple endowment in their head to see how seriously significant and spiritually uplifting and crucially important this actually is. This is not just Mickey Mouse sort of half-hearted attempt at, oh, well, you know, call on the angels. Oh, whoop, it's time for my bedtime. The angel didn't show up. I got to quit. No, this was not lightheartedly done any more than the Mormon temple endowment is. So put those words in your mind when I read this description. The various crosses on Smith's parchments are associated with the Mormon temple endowment, the esoteric rites and practices as symbols of protection. Who among us doesn't remember going through that endowment, receiving the garment, and being told it would be a protection to us? You see what I mean? So this is not just secondary or, or kind of second-rate stuff. This is at the forefront of power, authority, truth from God in a magical symbolic aspect on these parchments, they took this stuff seriously. So that's, I just, I won't overemphasize this, but it's really important here. And these symbols, these various esoteric rites and practices find their roots in the crucifixion of Christ. As Dan Vogel explains, the nature of the gold crosses, Vogel explains how the use of magic circles while treasure digging is for protection against evil spirits. Now, when a Melchizedek priesthood leader heals someone or attempts to get the behind me Satan, as happened in early Mormonism, they took this quite seriously. That's the nature that I want you to understand these magic parchments possessing with these symbols. This is their version. They didn't have the word, okay? They didn't have Joseph Smith kind of more or less constructed this in his own theological way when he gave Melchizedek priesthood to the men, okay? But this is Melchizedek priesthood seriousness. I just want you to get that. This is not secondary to it. This is it. So protection against evil spirits. Nobody can doubt that Smith relied upon the symbols of the parchments to aid in treasure digging, and he relied upon spirits and angels mentioned in biblical sources as well as those that are not of the Bible, but are handed down from the astrologer John D. This is so important. We've got the evidence, man. Seriously, here's a connection that the church has never admitted, and yet we have the evidence here. Compliments of cultist Edward Kelly, who acted as his scryer by communicating directly with spirits. Joseph Smith was peeping with spirits. Why do you think Moroni showed up in the first place? while Joseph Smith was involved in the treasure digging. 
When you see that magical worldview connection, it takes your breath away. And then Moroni set up that series of interviews with Joseph Smith once a year, every year for four years at the Autumnal Equinox, September 21, 22nd, exactly in line with the power of when the heavens connect with the earth. Call it Melchizedek priesthood power. It doesn't matter. It is all coordinated for influencing the heavenly into the earthly. But it was not done by any other avenue than magic. And I know Mormons hate that word. I get it. I, look, at one time I did too, right? I, magic, you're just an anti-Mormon idiot. I wouldn't even talk to people who mentioned the word, right? Well, D. Michael Quinn kind of took it in the teeth from the church a lot for breaking this ground. Dan Vogel hasn't exactly been praised by a lot of people in the church for finally getting to a much more realistic truth, is how I'll put this, on the actual history. I'm not going to be given a gold star on my forehead for this video tonight any more than Dan Vogel will be from the church brethren. But really, truly, this is the basis not only of the communication from the outside, that is, the heavenly descent into the earthly in order to help make it more holy and viable and useful and protective for humans. I mean, this is part of the whole nature, looking at the big picture here, with this magical material. The word magical is no longer able to be seen as satanic from Mormons who finally get the more full picture of the founding of their religion. So let me keep going. Paul Osborne has done an enormous amount of work. Yes, and now this is out of Barrett. This is out of the Magus a complete system of occult philosophy. Hey, if I could just real quick, once again, I know we, we have to clarify this, and sometimes we say this over and over and over again, and people just do not get it. The word occult has nothing to do with Satan. It, it, it just doesn't, okay? Let's just be realistic here. The word occult, a complete system of occult philosophy. The way the Mormons say this is, it's sacred, not secret, you know, concerning the endowment. Why we don't talk about what happens within the temple. And that's good. We can respect that. I have no desire to expose all that stuff like new name Noah likes to. I'm not into that. But the word occult is not satanic. It just means hidden, or if you will, sacred. So magic is the Renaissance version of priesthood. I, I'm going to put a, I have to do it this way to help Mormons grasp that we're not talking Satan and God here. We're talking God only. When we discuss the magic, the, the treasure seeking spirits, the intelligences, the invocations using the incantations of the angelic names, Raphael, Gabriel, Uriel, etc. This isn't God versus devil. This is all under the rubric, the umbrella, if you will, of holy religion. 
from the magic worldview. I think this is what Quinn was trying to get across. And it so terrified the brethren, simply because, of course, they had they had labeled it so vehemently, so vociferously as evil, that now they had to backpedal, right? And so, but that that sour taste in our mouth for the occult is still, you know, somewhat here. There's still some bitterness there within a lot of members' minds, spirits, hearts, etc. But that is not what we're talking about here. We are talking about something that was considered holy. Just grasp that seriously from this from this point of view. This is not devil worshipers. It's just not. So when the apologists for Mormonism really rant and rave against that, well, against the view, against the the very use of the word magic, they disparage anybody who even mentions the word, right? I mean, all you had to do <laughs> was read the Farms Review of Books of D. Michael Quinn and some of Dan Vogel's materials to see that. But that's to miss the whole underlying philosophical, spiritual, religious thinking of that day in Joseph Smith's time. I just want to clarify that. Because we're going to bring something else up here that's really a whopping good point. We put our philosophy... We put our kind of thinking, our attitude today, 2024, back onto Joseph Smith and judge them from this vantage point. Well, the cure for that myopic approach is to take a few courses in actual history. How do you actually do history, right? Because it is just a wrong method. It is wrong, and it is wrong-headed to judge history from your morality, from your philosophy and thinking, and from your experience. We incorrectly call so much in antiquity, we call it, primitive, or worse, we label their religious ceremonies and their rites and their prayers as devil worship, evil, etc. You label it, and then you can attack it without trying to understand it. I just want to clarify that because it's really important to grasp the full context because this will shock you. Intelligent, now this is out of Barrett, Francis Barrett the Magus. Intelligences and spirits, and of the threefold kind of them, and of their different names, and of infernal, and uh, I can't see it something or Neil spirits. Now, consequently, we must discourse of intelligences, spirits, and angels. An intelligence is an intelligible substance free from all gross and purifying, putrefying mass of a body. It's immortal. It's insensible. It's assisting all having influence over all, and the nature of all intelligences, spirits, and angels is the same, but I call angels here not those whom we usually call devils, but spirits so-called from the propriety of the word, as it were, knowing, understanding, and wise, but of these according to the tradition of magicians, think priesthood leaders, there are three kinds, I'm serious, think priesthood leaders. The tradition of magicians, there are three kinds. The first of which we call super celestial 
and minds altogether separated from a body and as it were intellectual spheres worshiping one only god as it were have their form and stable unity on center or center sorry gosh that that print is so cotton picking small i apologize my eyes are blurry he's talking about the different orders of intelligences spirits and angels that come in the exact same distinguishing hierarchical nature of man which Joseph Smith taught. And this is considered the single greatest doctrine in an ancient book of Abraham that he supposedly translated from Egyptian papyri. We now see the exact same kind of teaching based on the exact same kind of philosophy in the magical worldview. And we've got the evidence. That blows me away because this is all anti-Mormon junk. And yet it's Joseph Smith's greatest doctrine. That Mormons still scream, I don't care if the if I don't care if Joseph Smith translated the papyri correctly or not, and I'm here to say he did not do so, but it doesn't matter to me because the doctrines of the intelligences and, and all of that, one is greater than the other. Jesus Christ is greatest of them all. In the book of Abraham, chapter three, the premortal existence, etc., all of that is so grand, there's no way Joseph Smith could have made this up. And in that, they're correct. But he certainly could have gotten it from the magic worldview because we've got the same principle, philosophy, and religion in the magical worldview. That's huge. Folks, that's huge. There's the source. <laughs> There's the influence. Did Joseph Smith have to actually... Read Francis Barrett's The Magus himself in order? Did he actually have to do all of the research himself in order to put this together? Well, a naive interpretation of church history could suggest that. However, realistically, when you read the history of the church, and especially in the Joseph Smith papers, folks, hang on, I'm going to show this. I'm going to show you the evidence. Don't believe in what I say. You look it up yourself. I absolutely insist on it. And I, I'm just pulling out one volume. I'm only pulling out one volume of many volumes of the Joseph Smith papers. This is the administrative records, the Council of 50 Minutes, March 1844 to January 1846. Joseph Smith was constantly in council with dozens of men whom, through the previous decade, he had sent many, many hundreds of them on missions over the ocean, off into the foreign countries, all over the eastern United States, down south, up north, up into Canada, etc. And they brought back books, articles, newspapers. And we now know, and I do believe uh, Doug Yancey is still here. Doug Yancey and I did a wonderful video on the influence of the Erie Canal, which went right through Joseph Smith's hometown, and we know that that was a complete interstate eight-lane highway, so to speak, of solid information transportation all 
over New York from overseas. New York was the harbor, you guys. The information began flooding and flowing through the Erie Canal and being disseminated. The essential picture that has been um, supplanted in my mind because of the actual uh, coming to light of the actual history now is that what I was raised to believe in is Joseph Smith was born, raised, and lived in a vacuum, and most of his knowledge, 90% of his knowledge, came through a shaft of light, of revelation, only from heaven, and that's where Joseph Smith came to his understanding of, it didn't matter what, you know, geography, the economy, it didn't matter what subject, spirituality, religion, translation, scriptures, antiquity, it didn't matter what subject. God was giving it to him because he was so isolated. That's a completely false picture. So he didn't necessarily have to do all the research. He was in councils with the brethren nonstop on absolutely every subject you can imagine. Religious, spiritual, economic, financial, psychological, sexual, you name it. We really do. Without exaggeration, we actually have the evidence in the Joseph Smith papers. So this is significant, kind of a, you know, a broadening, a widening of the, uh, of the issue. Yeah. So this theme of intelligences, spirits, and angels is fundamentally not unique at all with a premortal existence of humanity. It was had in the worldview, the magic worldview. That's huge, folks. That's huge. That's one of the last remaining doctrines, incidentally, in the book of Abraham. That's keeping people having faith in it. They always bring that one up. Okay, I concede the point. Joseph Smith's translation is bogus. Yeah, all right. He blew it with the papyri, etc., but the doctrines are so holy. They are so elevating. They couldn't have helped but come through revelation from God. And therefore, I still believe it's authentic. Man, you go out there and you look on YouTube. That's their response now. That one doesn't work either. Fascinating, isn't it? Quite fascinating. So, um, Robert Brown, 1728. This is the angel Juban Ladache who wrote, O God, why should the people upon the earth rejoice? Or wherein should the pleasures of their sensual delights be fixed? This is moon, hold your course. Or why are the stars observing an order? So we need to grasp the fact that Juban Ladache pays direct reference to the moon and stars. Could this be related to the design incorporated into the magic parchment? Indeed it could, because that's, that's the theater of the angels. See, that's their reference point, the moon and the stars. You got to understand, Joseph Smith never did come home after a hard day's work on the Kirtland Temple, sit in his lazy boy, kick his feet up, turn on the TV, and watch Archie Bunker on television. They didn't have that or radio, but they did have the stars, right? So, very important. And here again, 
occult philosophy involved magical names given for the angels. Now, this seems rather mysterious and is riddled with a great deal of speculation, which is entirely true. And here are a couple of bites that express this exact sentiment. And this is from Francis Barrett, the Magus. I'm going to try to get a little closer here. Hold on. Oh, my. Oh, I can't even read that. Oh, he's talking about the character and seals of spirits. He's talking about the guardian spirits. That used to be considered an apostate Christian doctrine. James Talmadge ran and raved against that. And then uh, so on and so forth. The true definition of the characters are perfectly clear. And they aren't the kind of angels or influence that we've been taught about. So that's kind of interesting. To see the comparison contrast between what the modern church has been trying to teach us for all these years and what the actual nature of the evidence is showing us, which is quite shocking. Oh, there we go. Sorry, I lightened up my uh, I lightened up my screen. Yeah, they say the characters of seals of spirits, they're nothing less than unknown letters and writings. Unknown letters and writings. Is that a familiar theme in Joseph Smith? I mean, sincerely. Reformed Egyptian, an unknown language, lost to mankind, so he had to translate it. You know, the Adamic language had been lost, so he was trying to restore it. I mean, this is right out of the magical worldview, right? And it's completely, totally saturated in the worldview of Joseph Smith's version of the Book of Mormon book, which, of course, tells the history of the Nephites and the Lamanites, the most correct book, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's all based upon this magic worldview philosophy. It's amazing. It's just absolutely amazing. The angelic spirits, they are pure intellect and altogether incorporeal. Joseph Smith put that onto the intelligences instead. He later materialized spirit. He said spirit is just finer stuff, etc. They became very materialistic without question. So, let's be perfectly clear that these things were had by the Smiths, and they were considered sacred in the magical use in which they were intended, treasure-seeking. And that is exactly right. Paul has it exactly correct. So, the round circles formed within the name of Juband Ladache are standard icons, and they represent or express certain things. Note the round is given as the second symbol on the first row in Barrett's chapter in the Kabbalah of Ceremonial Magic. Even the symbols are matching the sun, the moon, the stars, etc. I mean, come on, DNC 76, folks. The telestial kingdom, the terrestrial kingdom, the celestial kingdom. The split between the three degrees of glory, which is symbolized astrologically. The sun, the moon, the stars. It's just so interesting how when we, when we now see the elaboration of this particular contextual philosophy that has not been included within the environment of Joseph Smith in old church history because they didn't like it. Now that we see it, it all fits together. It, it's really quite sincerely interesting. Is an I'm not asking this to be irreverent. 
But this begs a question, doesn't it? Um, how can I best put this without being insulting? Is, is Joseph Smith's restoration based on scriptural Christianity or on Renaissance magic? That's not a superfluous question. You know, I mean, holy smokes, man. So let's keep going. Interesting stuff. Oh, and this is so important. Now, I'm really grateful for Paul Osborne's research. I, I, I'm really glad he did this uh, because we... Uh, we we really do see now how the church is attempting to soft pedal the just saturation of the magic world view, not only in just the Smith family. Now we're not you don't have to single out Joseph Smith as a culprit, as a sinister con man, head dog. This was actually their cultural way of life that they, they ate slept and drank the magic worldview kind of like a goldfish does water because they can't do otherwise it it, it just is their culture it, it's how they live it's all they know right so finally when this forced the church to yeah, more or less, come clean with its own elaboration of history, and they were literally forced to bring out this information on this, this really substantially verified background of what was really happening. The church attempts to soft pedal it. And so what Paul Osborne did is he went to the church website, and he responds to their soft peddling, and I, I think this is so invaluable. So let me let me read here. The church website says Joseph Smith's critics often tried to disparage him by calling him a money digger or a treasure digger. Some of them, but the church did far worse by disparaging the critics for calling him what he actually was, and they actually excommunicated them all. So the church has the more grievous heavyweight sin around its neck, right? Paul says, let's be clear, Joseph's activities as a money digger or a treasure seeker in no way whatsoever provides any credit to his character. Everything about those ventures prove a liability in demonstrating what kind of people Joseph and his family were. The magic parchments are physical proof of that. So the church says, rather than deny the charge, Joseph acknowledged in his official history that Josiah Stoll had hired him in 1825 to assist in a treasure-seeking venture in northern Pennsylvania and the church never taught us that in seminary or Sunday school or sacrament meeting. They also tried to skip over that part of Joseph Smith's early youth and manhood when he uh, he was getting close to he was either getting close to marrying Emma, eloping off with her, <laughs> eloping off with her against her father's wishes, or getting ready to. So, yeah, so Paul says, Stoll hired Joseph because of his famed credentials and experience in actually practicing the occult magic, which I'm going to add, Joseph Smith had been doing for several years. And Joseph Smith was up to the task, and Stoll opened his wallet and paid him to do just that. He used the boy because he thought he possessed spiritual gifts to control spiritual realms and uncover and seize treasure, which, without magic, could never be obtained. And you were excommunicated. 
when I was a youth, in my teenage Aaronic priesthood youth, there were people who, had they said that, they would have been excommunicated and kicked out for apostasy. And yet now that's the main history. So let's keep going. The church website says Stowell wanted his help because Joseph was reputed by some of his neighbors to be a, quote, seer, someone who could look into a special stone and find lost or hidden objects. Paul says, yes, Joseph had a resume and a reputation for practicing magic. Looking into that stone to find treasure was the desire of Joseph's heart because his heart was set on the things of the world. The art of deception was Joseph's expertise, and that continued into the spiritual realm in which Mormonism was founded. So the church website says, seeing and seers were part of the culture in which Joseph Smith grew up. Some people in the early 19th century believed it was possible for gifted individuals to see lost objects by means of material objects such as stones. Joseph Smith and his family, like many around them, accepted these familiar folk practices. Paul says, you know the old adage, two wrongs don't make a right. The Smith family was just as wrong as any other family in their community. Folk magic was practiced by the Smith family. That was the very foundation of which Mormonism came into existence. The stone, the hat, the angels, the imagined treasures. That is exactly what inspired Mormonism. Boom, baby. Paul Osborne, you'd have had your Melchizedek priesthood butt handed to you on a platter and exited out the door 50 years ago. But now you're teaching actual history. And it's history that the church knows actually uh, is, was. That's that's what happened. Yeah. So... I think that's enough. I've been going about an hour 22. Um, the base, hold on, hold on. Let me, do you mind if I keep going for just a couple more minutes, you guys? Oh, hey, hi, Debbie Donovan. Oh, and Coco B, good to see you. I'm Blake Jensen, good to see you. And Patty Cake, I haven't said hi to all you guys. You mind if I keep going for just another moment? Okay, Smith family magic parchments. Okay, so the Smith family owned three magic parchments that were carried in a bag meant to be worn by the owner. So the parchments blend a mixture of Christianity and magic occult symbolism. They were probably used as lamans, that is, pendants. The idea here of this is to focus magical energies Think Melchizedek priesthood here. I'm serious. Think that, because that is the theme that the church wanted to focus on. It wanted it to be the heavenly Melchizedek priesthood, not this magic energy, but it's they're both the same thing. So the pendants are meant to focus magical energies for a variety of purposes, of course. And so the very existence of these parchments suggest that the Smith family had more than a passing interest in magic. Absolutely. Many of the magic symbols are copied directly out of magical texts. Absolutely. We have the evidence of the Magus by Francis Barrett, published in 1801, the new and complete illustration of celestial sciences by Ebenezer Sibyl, and that was earlier, 1784. See, that's uh, what, uh, 16 years earlier than Barrett. And the Discoveries of Witchcraft by Reginald Scott, published in 1584. All of these sources were available to Joseph Smith. So this, oh, criminy. That's right. Mormon News Roundup is tonight. It starts in six minutes. Oh, I am so sorry. I don't, I don't mean to step on his time. Goodness sakes. Um. So there's three parchments, the Jehovah, 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 amen, 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 and holiness to the Lord. 
So this is mingled with the hope and the faith in an angel that has nothing to do at all with the Bible, but was named and created by the likes of occultists beginning with Kelly and D. The angel Juban Ladache, along with his name and Laman, is used for occult magic in invoking the power of witchcraft. Get this. The power of witchcraft was considered white magic, not devil, but white magic. But even that's not biblical. It's not sanctioned by Christian teachings as expressed in the New Testament. So here's the point. It's a good point to close on. Clearly, the Smiths were engaging in rituals outside the bounds of Christian theology. And they were calling upon a spirit that was invented and brought by use or to use by occultists. And of course, they had all kinds of various magical arts. And Joseph Smith later get discontinued because he failed to successfully implement and bring to fruition his desires for actual monetary treasure. But he did end up with uh, a riches with the people. So, yes, Debbie Donovan, Lucy Mack has an interesting history. It was generational interest in the occult. And Doug Vincent and I are going to be doing some videos together on that. Thank you for bringing that up. That's very important. Again, Joseph Smith's own mother uh, is superb evidence for this magic worldview. Uh, Doug Vincent and I are working behind the scenes on that. We're not quite sure when we can put it together, but we've got some plans going there. So, yeah, I really like Mormon News Roundup with dives. Um, you guys need to scoot over there. If you if you have to scoot over there, go and go with my blessing. I'm just about wrapped up here, but uh, dives is good stuff. Support him and go give him several likes, too. He's a good man. I could have swore I saw Radio Free Mormon here, too. Welcome, Radio Free Mormon. I don't want to skip anybody if I can. Uh, I think you're all around here. So anyway, yeah, yeah. In essence, my point, what, uh, what, what interests me, what keeps me working and going on this is the greater expanding context, uh, which means we include more than we exclude, and the church has been excluding more than it includes. So it's kind of a topsy-turvy backflip, backflop, sort of doing the opposite of what the church used to do in my youth. And it's doing it grudgingly, but it really is doing it. I believe that is because of the social media. There's no choice. So it's really quite fun. So anyway... That is just about what I've got prepared for you tonight. And, and like I say, I didn't do any of this work. Uh, Dan Vogel and Paul Osborne get all the glory, along with D. Michael Quinn, of course, and, and others. Um, so uh, thank you for all your support, for all your love. Uh, if you gave me some super chats and I didn't see them, thank you for those. Those do help keep me going. If if it's okay with you, it's okay with me. It doesn't have to be a lot, uh, but the the super chats help. The donations help. I do have a PayPal, et cetera. This isn't about the money, but the money's help. Uh, I just ridiculed Joseph Smith for being a treasure seeker, and now here I am being a treasure seeker. No, I'm not going to do it to manipulate people. I'm going to do it to turn around and help share more good knowledge. So anyway, that's my justification for it. What the heck? Yeah, baby, says Doug Vincent. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Patty Cake. Yeah, it is fun. It is a lot of fun. All righty. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. It's time for you guys to pivot over to Dives Mormon News Roundup. He's a good man. I love that guy. He's all, Oh, I'm going to be doing a podcast with him later on this month. So I'll have to shorten this one and bump over there. You can watch me twice in one night. What a bore that'll be. <laughs> All right, you guys. Thank you for everything. Be good to well. Have fun. Be friends with everybody. Make lots of friends. And I will see you next week, if not earlier.